Um, for those of you whom I've not met, my name is Scott Ludlam. I'm one of your uh, Australian Greens representatives for WA. And I have had the privilege in the last five years of also being the National Communication Spokesperson for the Greens, and that's given us the ability to weigh in in a bit of an independent way and say stuff that others won't say and take positions that others, for some reason or another, can't be bothered taking. And uh, I've actually felt very well supported and, and looked after by the tech community here in Australia who, as you'd be aware, are bullshit and never short of an opinion and it's uh, really improved the, the quality of the debate. Um, maybe just by way of starting to acknowledge that we're on Aboriginal ground, we're on the country of the Wadjuk Noongar people and uh, they've been here roughly 200 times as long as this city, depending on when you start counting. Um, and to also maybe just give you a bit of a sense of how tonight might go, I'm only three days into the campaign <coughs> and already thoroughly sick of the sound of my own voice. So I'm probably going to speak really briefly and the q and I suspect is where things are going to get most interesting. So I'll, I'll be fairly quick in my opening remarks and then we can just, you can fly off the handle if you like. Um, my background in this is not a technical one, but I was uh, trained as a graphic designer in 1995, myself and three mates, um, quit our various jobs, sold my car, and formed up one of the first little web development studios that you've never heard of in Perth, starting out working for Mount Designs, actually, just up Hay Street. Um, taught ourselves HTML, ran, you know, ran a decent show for a couple of years and then hit the wall. Uh, but that's kind of my background. I realize um, that probably you're my association. If you've been around in 95, I probably would be an office bearer by now. Uh, would have, yeah, would have been, would have been part of this little unit. So it's great to kind of be here, speaking to folk in the development community. Um, that was why I think uh, when I got elected, it wasn't tech or comms issues that got me interested in politics in the first place. It was something at the other end of the technology spectrum, which is nuclear energy, which is probably a better subject for a, a different night and a bit more beer. Uh, but when I did get elected, which was uh, uh, November 2007, after having been involved in the Green Movement for, for about uh, 10 years or so, a little bit longer than that, um, Bob Brown handballed off the communications portfolio like a hot potato that he couldn't wait to be rid of, and I couldn't believe my luck, and I've had an absolute ball. One of the first things that I ran into was the net filter debate. In uh, 2008, in the course of a, of a budget estimates committee, was basically accused of being a pedophile by our, our uh, recently departed communications minister for daring to question why we would be interested in the Australian government uh, uh, basically screening any content that was effectively unclassifiable into Australia. We ended up actually having quite a collegiate working relationship because after we beat the net filter, uh, the Labor Party scaled up the NBN and we're actually quite supportive of that as, a, as an engineering concept uh, compared to some of the alternatives. And also in the public interest, the fact that we renationalized half of Telstra seemed to have gone a bit unnoticed, not that that was how we messaged it at the time. Um, and that now we're well on the way to, you know, not, not far enough as long as, as anybody will like, but we're on the way to providing a, a very rapid open access universal service network to the whole continent, which is actually really exciting. If there's no change of government, not that I'm here to campaign for the Labor Party, believe me, but if there's no change of government and you get another three years on the volume rollout of the NBN, I think it'll be too hard to stop. If there is a change of government, I think they're going to wreck it. We're going to end up with this kind of disaster of 70 or 80,000 cabinets on every second street corner that's going to basically choke us at, the, at that node. So we're supportive of the NBN. So we worked with, with Stephen Connery on that. And the, the, my first taste, I guess, of online campaigning and how these issues can play out, this collision of communications and politics really was the net filter campaign where nobody really directed that. It was quite anarchic. It was extremely well informed and occasionally a bit unhinged and we won. Right before the 2010 election campaign, or actually as, as we were a couple of weeks into it, um, the Labor Party basically realized they had no allies. They'd alienated precisely the community that they needed to back them on the NBN and they dropped it. They kind of shelved it just before the, the election campaign to try and take it off the table. Exactly the same thing just happened with the second major 
digital rights campaign I was involved in, which was data retention, which was deeper and more scary than the filter and a lot more momentum behind it and a lot harder to pin down. Instead of an election announcement by the Commerce Minister, hey, we're going to filter your internet, you've got something happening under the table very covertly and a reasonable number of lies being told in order to prevent you from finding out what's actually going on. That was the two-year mandatory data retention proposal that I've seen now kind of go through two turns of the wheel, originating in the Attorney General's Department, probably originating in Washington, D.C. That uh, ISPs would need to trap and store a certain subset of data so that your metadata could be mapped and mined down the track for no less than two years. Really unpopular proposal, and uh, as you'd be aware, it got flipped to a parliamentary committee where a bit of sunlight got shone on it and that committee, which is quite rare actually, it's not one that we're on because the crossbench spot is occupied by Andrew Wilkie, the committee was actually pretty damning in its, in its uh, bipartisan condemnation of two-year data retention. It's a proposal that is very poorly thought out, there is no rationalisation, you haven't explained what it's going to cost or why you need it. But it does, for me, um, exemplify some of the trouble that we're in now because, quite frankly, the revelations of whistleblower Edward Snowden around real-time tracking, not simply of metadata, but of content data and of everything, blows that data retention proposal completely out of the water. Uh, we're in, um, to continue with the water metaphor, maybe just because I got rained on, we're in much deeper water than we thought. And stuff that two months ago if I'd sat in front of you and said, hey, this is all happening, you would have fitted us out for a tin foil hat. But it's, it's real. A lot of it is apparently real. We don't know how deep it goes because, of course, there's a lot more lying going on around the extent to which the NSA and its allies and its partner organisations around the world are able to engage in effectively uh, um, splitting off all of this data and creating a gargantuan archive not of all of it, I suppose, because there's still vastly more than you can trap and store, but of a significant <coughs> fraction of it for a very large number of people. In addition to that metadata mapping, which in my mind is also really concerning because of just how much you can tell about people and their networks and their transactions and their physical location, uh, having access to the content as well is pretty scary when you think about it. Or maybe that's a proposition that we should test because I've bumped into plenty of people in the last two months who don't think it's scary at all. And that I think is probably the, the biggest single part of the trouble that we're in isn't necessarily the technology or the mindset behind it, it's the way in which reasonable numbers of people have just gone, so what? I, th I thought they could already do that. And anyway, I don't have anything to hide. So is it really such a big deal? That's what scares me the most actually. Um, that attitude. I tend to, um, I scribbled these notes on my phone, apologies, so as it keeps locking itself, I have to keep going back to work out what I was going to say. Um, in the 1990s, the cypherpunks introduced this kind of axis or this concept that you're probably all very familiar with between transparency and privacy. And the general theory is the more powerful and large you are, the less you are owed privacy and the more you owe transparency to the rest of us. Transparency for very large transnational corporations and for governments and for the military industrial complex. Privacy for ordinary citizens just going about their daily lives. And in between a very interesting spectrum where very interesting arguments can happen. What we have at the moment is the opposite of that. We have precisely the opposite. We have Facebook and Google and uh, others telling us that privacy has been annihilated for ordinary citizens and is dead. Don't worry about it. It's gone. You have none. And on the uh, other end of the spectrum, we have these two words, national security, that justify uh, vast, opaque goings on behind the scenes in the name of national security. We have that balance that the cypherpunks were trying to remind us that we needed to hit, in my opinion, backwards. Um, and you, the, the best, the strongest examples of that that you can see that I've encountered personally would be these estimates committee sessions across the table from the Attorney General's department where they would obfuscate and throw sand up in your face and try and misdirect and point you elsewhere and occasionally almost flat out lie in your face, totally opaque, uh, to advance a project around massive transparency for all of us and the effective technical abolition of privacy done under complete cover of darkness because national security. So that's the trouble that we're in. 
We're in much deeper trouble in the United States, of course, where the debate is happening in a whole different way and is somewhat more militarised than it is here. What's happening here that worries me most, I guess, is the because the two major parties are so utterly intent on running dead and not making eye contact with anybody that it's actually quite difficult to get a, to get a run. So most of the interesting stuff is happening overseas. So who knew? The UK parliamentary equivalent to our Joint Intelligence Committee went to the US to demand some answers, keeping in mind UK intelligence is deeply implicated in exactly the same kind of stuff. Nonetheless, the European Commission wrote to the US Attorney General, uh, there's a privacy commissioner inquiry being launched in Canada, German's justice minister is up in arms banging the table, German PM has suggested a treaty on protecting communications, the most interesting debates are actually happening in the US where this has united what's left of the Democrats and the Tea Party. You know, the kind of libertarian wing of the Republican Party who are going, well, look, we wrote the Patriot Act and we didn't want it to do that, including one of the authors who said some extremely strong stuff about, we didn't think we were authorizing you to do that. The defunding of the prison program bill in the House of Representatives in the United States failed by seven votes uh, at the end of July. So there's a huge debate touched off there and in Australia, we've got something really different. Actually, we don't have much of anything at all. If it weren't for The Guardian and a very small handful of, of quite good national security reporters, like literally a handful, uh, nobody here would really know what was going on unless you're copying your, your news online, which fortunately a lot of people are. So what do we do about it? Um, particularly in a, in a fairly literate room like this, I'm actually going to pose this to you as a question. We've got ideas along that axis between personal privacy and personal protection and yes you can encrypt your email, although why should we have to, but you can. Um, along that axis to the kind of law reform proposals where that's not really good enough to just tell people go to a crypto party and work out how to use Tor. Not really good enough to take not just ordinary citizens but journalists, whistleblowers, climate change demonstrators, occupiers, Aboriginal rights, sea shepherds, uh, and tell them that in order to remain safe from police surveillance, they need to go and learn the same tool set as the Mafia and AQ. You know, you're pushing people uh, into the shadows effectively in order to protect entirely legitimate communications. And that further blurs the boundary which is being deliberately blurred here and in the United States between lawful, healthy dissent and terrorism. And it's a really serious thing here or in the United States to accuse somebody of being a terrorist or being supportive of terrorist networks because all sorts of really horrific medieval laws kick in in the Western world if you end up categorized in that way. So that in itself is actually quite dangerous, which is why I think uh, we should actually learn how to protect ourselves better, particularly if we are playing a role in society where we might have the occasional disagreement with the government, but it's not good enough. It really isn't, to just make it back about our own personal agency. Actually, we have to push back collectively, I think, and stop some of this behavior from occurring at all. Uh, we have some ideas. The Get a Warrant Bill now seems a little bit quaint, um, in a sense, doesn't it? That was around the metadata snooping. I still think it's a really good idea, by the way, that so much of this stuff is warrantless, and that shouldn't be the case. But the fact is they've done an end run around us. So that is still a very important proposal. We'll be progressing that if I'm re-elected in September. Um, some other good ideas that were occurring like mandatory data breach notification that was perched on the edge of Senate debate and never quite made it. Um, the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act needs to be burnt down and rebuilt from scratch. It's one of the only things that I agree with the Secretary of the Attorney General's Department about. It's a, it's a bit of a mess, and it's been so completely wormholed as to be almost useless. Um, if you were going to rebuild the TIA Act again, you would build things into it like, like warranted surveillance for, for anything of any consequence. Um, and we need to do something about this Five Eyes Agreement between the intelligence services of like-minded countries, including the United States, to actually start to bring this debate and this agenda back under control. The single problem that we have, particularly with 31 days to go until an election, is that it's faded from the front page, and if we don't put it there, nobody else is going to. That uh, was partly why I was keen to come along tonight, because we are going to need a hand in communities of interest with like-minded people. Maybe you don't own a newspaper. Does anybody here own a newspaper? 
damn it. People keep just not putting their hands up at these events. But we do own the net, really. You know, the people like Edward Snowden, who got hired by this corporation to do the dirty work and had an attack of conscience and went, I just can't do this anymore, now it's wrecked his life, is actually, I think, the Achilles heel of the whole structure. Is there's a whole generation of people coming through now who don't buy the bullshit and will blow the whistle on it. We need to step up and protect them because what's happening to Bradley Manning and Ed Snowden uh, is being done not specifically to punish them, but to warn off everybody else. They're having an example made of them in a really pretty nasty way. So the more that we can do, the more noise we make, uh, the more we push back, the better our ideas are for counter proposals rather than just opposition, the safer the world becomes, not just for them, but for all of us. I'll probably leave it there and thanks very much for staying back. There are no questions. We are going to meditate for 20 minutes. Go on, go grab the mic. Okay, so what does that activism sound like? What does it look like? You know, yes, really. That's better. Okay. What does that activism look like? I mean, I, I know from my personal experience, there's certainly plenty of on the, the, the lefty leaning people in my Twitter sphere, and if I Twitter to them, there's a wonderful little echo chamber going on. Yeah. But that's not the people we need to be speaking to. So, how yeah. do we get into that other side of politics to convince the the the, the right wing who we are, aren't necessarily on, in contact with on a day to day basis? This is an issue they need to be concerned about. The funny thing is, I reckon this perplexes the concept of left and right. Um, one of the only things in the entire solar system with which I agree with the Institute of Public Affairs, sort of arch right wing, quite nasty little, little think tank out there on the fringes, uh, have been some of our best allies on this stuff. Fought really hard, and I believe they would fight quite hard against Tony Abbott as well, on uh, data retention and, uh, and censorship. So we have some odd allies, the same thing as I said is happening in the United States. So we have access to two echo chambers, and they're, they're reasonably large and they're porous. But in the 31 days, and forgive me, you invited a politician to speak at your thing in the middle of an election campaign, so you're going to cop a little bit of this, um, is that we've got to elevate it off the Twitter sphere, which is already pretty pissed off, as you say, and get it onto TV and into the paper, just for the time being. Um, so one practical example that I can think of is, can you help me? So Turnbull and, and Albanese are kind of puffing the chests out at each other about doing a debate at the National Press Club. Can you help me get into that? Can you get online and start, start bombing the press club going, this is not a two horse race anymore. And these guys are gonna give you Coke and Pepsi and we need some amazing organic juice or something. I don't know. <laughs> Please don't use that metaphor, that's really embarrassing. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like just cracking the consensus because it's gonna be a really boring debate. It's in the interest of the press club to not have a boring debate. If, if I can get on there, I'll try and make it interesting. So that's part of it. It's that kind of thing. Help, help us get out there. It was a pretty lame answer to a really big question, but I'll keep thinking. Well, could I ask you how um, new technologies, like I was just looking at Google Glass, and how that's going to impact the Privacy Act and anything that's <laughs> going to come forward from that? <laughs> like a neutron bomb. Um, uh, the glass in the whole AR thing, I find in equal parts repellent and really fascinating. I, it's like spotting a, a tsunami a really long way over the horizon and that when it gets here, it's gonna be very, very big. Um, what it does to privacy, and I think the reason people are already being called glass holes is that it just, <laughs> it, it totally annihilates it. If people are staring at you and they're all recording everything that's going on, bye-bye privacy. Um, Ironically enough, you already watch this mini little arms race of devices you can wear that just completely crashes the camera. So who knows where that's going. AR for me and that technology when it becomes completely ubiquitous and embedded on your body feels like a bit of an event horizon over which it's very difficult to see. You go and read William Gibson or science fiction of people who've been thinking about this stuff for a while. What it does for privacy, I don't know, who's got a good theory? Again. I feel like, sorry, just a quick comment. Mm. Um, but, you know, we're dealing with these issues online at all, and then, you know, like the, the glass, you know, it's right there in your face kind of thing. Yeah. Everything knows everything about you. 
But cyberspace has been bleeding into the real world in a really pervasive way for, for a while. It's, but that feels like a very substantial jump, doesn't it? Like that's a substantial advance. Not when there's only two or three people using it, but when there's only two or three people not using it, then uh, it's actually very, I find it very difficult to read, but it feels very big. Yeah. We've, we've got to confront some of this stuff before that wave hits us, I think, and there's probably still a bit of time. Sorry. It seems to me that, I mean, if you want to be on TV and you want to um, you know, make an, an impact in social media, then you need to be creating video. Yeah, because people talking to each other on Twitter is not particularly powerful. Um, I think it might be more powerful than we give it credit for. Uh, the net filter, and I maybe a, maybe I should caution against resting on it too much, but it was such an interesting case study. So let's fix that. What kind of leak? Water, water leaks. Um, Don't be paranoid. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm we I'm should. Coming from on no, this, I guess on. is it's not a sexy issue. So you've got 30, 31 days. Um, if your issue is not about economics or a scandal, it's mm. it's really not going to get a lot of air. It's true. <coughs> so. Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is to that. Okay, here's what I think. I think every year the net becomes a more important platform on which to conduct politics. Every single election, it's sucked up and incorporated more of the media space than the previous one. My view is still that this election campaign will still be won or lost on the front page of the Daily Telly and on Channel 9, but not for that much longer and less so than before. Um, I think already as an organising space, Twitter and Facebook and other social media technologies, including YouTube, are probably already more powerful than we give them credit for. We don't necessarily use them as well as we should be. So your comment about videos, create engaging content that will go all over the place. Um, but we, I feel like at the same time as this enormous threat has basically opened up in front of us, we've also been handed uh, extraordinarily powerful organising tools. So I, I, I tend, when I'm thinking about that kind of thing, is to not put Twitter down. It's an echo chamber, but it's a moderately big one. It's very well read. It's very well connected. It's moderately wealthy, quite well resourced. And it's international. We don't just have to solve this for ourselves. We need to link arms with people who are confronting this all over the place, for whom censorship and privacy are a matter of life and death. Probably nobody's going to bundle us into the back of a black van at the end of tonight's meeting. There are plenty of parts of the world where we could not do what we're doing now. Um, learning from them, learning from how they've protected themselves uh, is probably quite important and learning some of the organising techniques of people who've been doing this for a while uh, but wasn't the question I, I guess that you put I think we can use the net as an organising space even in terms of just pictures of funny cats you know, stuff that people will share that has a serious edge to it just to remind people when you get to the well ballot box um, My Go. response to that is is like, well, what can happen in the content space? Mm. You, you know, your, your, your issue is not that sexy and what, what kind of works in, in politics, it seems, is, you know, fear and loathing. <laughs> yep. So, you know, if, if we all knew that we could say with confidence your um, data, your emails are are being you know, viewed by people without warrants, mm. um, you know, that's scary. Yeah. And, and people might respond to that. I have some difficulty saying that to people because I've heard people say that that's the case and I've heard people say that it's not. Can you give us any kind of insight into what is actually happening there and how we could frame that as a message that mm. alarms people enough to take some action? Okay, there's two really distinct but related things there. So on the first one, a really good source actually is EFF in the United States, Electronic Frontiers Foundation, because they're not, they're not hippies. They are very guarded, and you can tell a fair bit of their content seems to be written by lawyers. They'll give you a spectrum of here's what might be happening. Here's the best case, here's the worst case of the kind of boundaries of, of what we think might be going on, and they, they're amending that reasonably frequently. Uh, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch or an exaggeration to say uh, that the NSA and its partner organisations in the Western world 
have been engaged at least since the 1990s in tapping the fibre cables and all of the satellite traffic in and out of everywhere, archiving as much of it as storage technologies will allow, including all the encrypted stuff that they can go back and hammer later, which is what this thing in Utah is apparently all about, uh, and that they, there's, an, there's an increasing storage archive of live real-time materials. If you read some of, the, some of Snowden's direct um, transcripts as an operator, as a guy who used these tools, you can be looking over the shoulder of someone as their email has been written, and you can divert a copy of the Skype chat as it's happening, anywhere you like, if you're a person of interest. There are very few places where that can't be done. So it doesn't mean that all of us are under surveillance all the time because the physical human intelligence capacity isn't there to scan everybody and most of us, quite frankly, are really boring. But it means it's all being archived for later in case you become interesting. And for me, that goes so vastly beyond notions of national security as to be really very chilling. So that's the first part. And the second part is uh, maybe we should team up with whoever's representing graphic designers these days and lock you all in a room with a case of beer and quite a lot of pizza and not let you out until or there until some memes have been generated that we can throw out there but it's a start well we know that can be done in a week <laughs> yeah well it can mm. um, just going on from that do you feel that it needs to be made a scandal before people will truly pay attention in a way that is actually required for the gravity of the actual reality involved here. I mean, you said it yourself that, you know, someone can in real time, over the shoulder, watch what people are doing online. And I, I, I saw comments along the lines of their, their criteria for this is two degrees of separation from a person of interest. And that's as everybody. anyone who's played the Kevin Bacon game knows, yeah. that's everyone in America and 50% of the rest of the planet. Yep. So that's all it takes to hit their benchmark criteria for being able to just do it without a warrant and just browse like you browse Wikipedia. You know, uh, yeah. this is truly the most offensive thing ever designed, yet no one seems to care because they feel they have nothing to hide. Does someone who feels they have nothing to hide have to be burned at the stake before they actually see this as the public menace that it is? Mm. Well, I think we've got to work with the people who are a jump closer to us than that. So there's that large population of people who've looked up and gone, well, the politicians aren't squawking, the media's not either really in any way, I don't have nothing to hide, so I back to my, back to my day. There, I, I think there's a substantial number of people who are actually really freaked out by this stuff and are looking to take a lead from somebody. And that short list of examples from overseas is quite powerful. So we are having this conversation in Australia which is, a, which is a client state of the United States government, is not in the interests of either of the old political parties to have this debate at all. They just don't want it had. So it feels as though um, it's a scandal already. Maybe what it will take is when, the, when we get disclosures of these tools being so clearly and obviously misused, which they are, which they will continue to be, uh, that it actually starts to affect people's daily lives. But in the meantime, I don't feel like I've got the luxury of sitting back and waiting for that to happen. You know, we've got we've to be ringing the alarm bell as loud as we can without sounding like loonies. Yeah. Just grab the mic, I think, or the stream can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Well, look. It's, it's for the internet. And hello, internet, if you're listening in. <laughs> and the NSA. So it's, it feels like you're fighting an uphill battle. Do you hope to stop it from happening or is it just an attempt to slow it down? Because looking at the way things are going, I think there's no real way of stopping it. It already happened. It, okay. it happened already, yeah. So is it, is, are, you going, um, are your attempts to, to stop, to, not to stop, but to slow things down or just to stop it at where it is? or? Um, I think it is around the organization of a full-scale pushback, a global one, a very large and determined and coordinated effort to roll this stuff back. Is the US is quite rapidly going authoritarian. Read some of the stuff that Julian Assange writes on this. He thinks about this a lot, and he's spent 
uh, what, three or four years now under various forms of house arrest, close confinement, reading the, the primary source material, how the world works. Uh, so it already happened, and there is a mass movement out there everywhere in the world, people like us having meetings like this, with greater or lesser degrees of technical skills, working out how to pull it apart, undermine it, and blow the whistle on it. So it's just that ongoing thing. Um, I don't feel like I'm the only person in Parliament who cares about this stuff. And yes, it is an uphill battle, but that's, you know, at some point there'll be a tipping point and we'll be fighting it downhill. In the meantime, it's about blowing the whistle and just keeping it, keeping it alive. That can be as simple as a letter to the editor. They might not print yours, but if 10 people write, they'll print one or two of them. Ring Talkback Radio, how come we're not talking about Ed Snowden anymore? You know, it's, it's lots and lots of actions like that that collectively are actually quite powerful. Um, hi, Scott. Hey. Um, what is the expectation of privacy nowadays? Uh, there's two parts to it. There's seeing people talk, talk amongst to each other, and there's that thing being the content of the conversation. One, when the Snowden story broke, uh, I read a fabulous, almost satire, but based on real life event that happened in the Boston before the year. And they looked, um, a mathematician went and looked at what community that Paul Revere and other Bos Bos huh. Bostonians had participated in. Yeah. And Paul Revere was st st sticking out like a sore thumb as one of the characters that would go on to obviously change the course of history. Um, another place I was also thinking of in terms of expectation of privacy, there's a wonderful place in Parliament House in Canberra between the two houses. Mm. You ha have the lower level which the parliamentarians and senator MPs and senators walk in. Yep. There's a water fountain. So people and the, up upper the public in the upper gallery can't hear what the conversation is downstairs, but they can see the politicians talking to each other, but not the content of the conversation. So I'm just curious about <laughs> what the expectation of privacy is. It probably depends who you ask. I'm going to give you a different question, uh, a different answer to that than probably you know, anybody you ask. The expectation of privacy, I think, in a democracy, we have an expectation that we should be free from state surveillance or corporate surveillance, for that matter, unless we're engaged in some sort of serious crime. That's my baseline expectation of privacy. We should be free from that. That's part of the democratic compact, in my view. Yeah, I, have, I have no essential problem uh, with uh, police and intelligence agencies wiretapping organised crime and wiretapping people who are planning to blow up aircraft or fly them into buildings. That's why those powers were granted, that's why some of these technologies were developed. And the compact we have is that we give you those powers to be really invasive and potentially ruin people's lives uh, in order to protect public safety against stuff that's serious. Uh, and in order to make sure that doesn't get completely out of hand, we're going to set the judiciary to look over your shoulder and make sure the paperwork is in order and that you're not going off the reservation. That's my expectation of privacy. And what has happened is that technology has just breached that like a wave and flowed around it and past it. Uh, ironically enough, in the name of technology where the AG's department will stand up every 20 minutes when they bring another bill into parliament to amend the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act, they'll say surveillance needs to keep up with technology because technology is changing. And the old privacy kind of buttresses and, and walls of warrants and judicial process and democratic oversight are kind of left back here in the late 19th century wondering what the hell happened. So that's part of the task, I think, as legislators, and that's the collective effort, is, well, if you needed a warrant to listen to my phone call because you think I'm in the mafia, that's okay. You should also need a warrant to do that, uh, to snoop on my email or my precise location every minute of the day. That's why we started with that bill. I think it actually expresses quite a deep concept about the relationship between the state and the individual. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, Who's hiding back there? How many people do we have back there? This is the anonymous corner. <laughs> um, you mentioned the EFF a minute ago. Uh, there's also the uh, American Civil, Civil Liberties Union in yeah. the States. Um, in addition to supporting politicians that, that care about these issues, um, are there organizations in Australia that do similar work that we can support as well? Yeah, there are. Hands up if you are not yet a member of EFA, Electronic Frontiers Australia. Okay, you could probably fix that in about 10 minutes online. So that's, that's the, those are the first crew. Um, even the Law Council, I think, were, what have they said about our bill? That it doesn't go far enough? 
Okay, so that's good. So the Law Council, uh, that'll be good. EFA are very good. They're very engaged in this, but they're a small organization and they need, they need support. So anything at all that we can swing towards them, I think are good. In the political mix, um, the Pirates are pretty engaged on this stuff. They're small, but w watch them. They, they got big very fast in Europe. And you've got WikiLeaks on the scene now carving this kind of crazy diagonal path across everything, surprising people and being pretty politically unorthodox, uh, who obviously have, have led this debate. In terms of other civil society organisations, um, I think what we really need to do is be reminding groups like Greenpeace and Sea Shepherds and Aboriginal land rights campaigners and uh, 350.org that if you are engaged in anything which involves a disagreement with the state, then you need to learn about this stuff really quickly. So w welding that alliance together is, is pretty important. Um, and maybe even some unorthodox ones. You know, the Walkley Foundation gave Julian uh, a uh, Walkley Award for services to journalism about three years ago. So I think they recognise that they're all on the line as well. So we do have allies kind of distributed all the way through, but it's not particularly well cohered yet, which I guess is kind of the point that you're making. EFA, they're, they'd be my first pick. Um, what is being done and what can be done to inform people about what's going on? Because you said that there's only a handful of people which actually report on it. In terms of mainstream journalists, yeah, um, there are a very small handful of people who report on this stuff. And um, in terms of in the formal press, there's a couple. Follow Bernard Keane um, on Twitter. Is, is very, very good on this stuff. Follow Phil Dorning, uh, Dorling, who works for Fairfax. Um, God, it's such a short list. Who else? I can't stop it too. Yeah, Delimiter, Renee is very good. So then you're kind of getting into the tech press, into the specialized tech press, and there, you know, you can follow ZNet, you can follow Computer World, they'll give this kind of stuff a run. There's a handful, but actually most of the interesting work is just individuals kind of toiling away behind the scenes. Um, was that your question? It wasn't, was it? <coughs> okay, thank you. So I answered a totally different question just then. Um, so using, again, the, the uh, various degrees of Kevin Bacon is share their stuff to everybody you know. When you see somebody who's literate and really onto it and putting these stories out there, um, share the hell out of it and make sure that people that you know who have never heard of Phil Dorling get to hear about him tonight and then they get to follow him. I think that's that's partly the power of the medium. And then get angry and please don't vote for these lunatics anymore. On the topic of not going far enough, do you feel there needs to be more protection around things like, um, for a while there, there was a bit of emphasis in Europe on this right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. But in, in a similar vein, um, along the lines of the ability to, without risking either the entirety of a company or, or your own personal freedoms and rights, the ability to burn the keys, so to speak, mm. and, and not be permanently in limbo should someone come down a year from now snooping around and asking for all those records that are locked up and now yeah. forever destroyed by burning those keys. Yeah. D does that need to be given weight in this modern age that if you in good conscience you know destroy the key you shouldn't be held criminally liable because you did it in good conscience you know the, the powers are supposedly for interception of things to come not not necessarily retroactive over mm. things that were done and, and does that need to be further protected i think it's a really perceptive question it's linked to the right to anonymity isn't it um i think that in terms of the right to be forgotten starts for me with the right to not have material collected unnecessarily in the first place, and that's where the data retention debate hinged. It's like, why do you need it? You actually don't. So, so forget it. Um, so I think those, those are really interesting issues, and they are, they're linked to, you know, if I want to go home and burn my diaries, that's my right. The state has absolutely nothing to say about that. I'm not sure why it should be any different with material records online really don't. If I go home and propose to burn my diaries and some red light starts flashing on the wall that says it's illegal for you to do that, then, then I'll know we're living in a police state. But actually, that's not that far from what you've just proposed. Mm. It's 
cheerful stuff, isn't it? I was just thinking about the CCTV um, invasion um, and the CCTV camera use is being used a lot for, you know, oh, we'll catch the criminals and we can stop this and we can stop that. And it has been publicised that it has actually helped with the apprehending of criminals, etc. Mm. Uh, how, how much of the CCTV camera, like I was in Singapore recently and just everywhere you go in Singapore is just recorded. Yeah. Everywhere you go in London is recorded. What's your view about CCTV use and, and, and its invasion of our um, society as an Australian? Good question. And yeah, I think London's London's one of the highest density of surveillance cameras in the world, maybe apart from Parliament House in Canberra. Um, it's extremely vexed, like it's, it's scary to see also how uh, widespread um, algorithmic facial recognition software is becoming and how utterly crap it still is and how many mistakes it still makes. Um, when you are then have the ability without any human agency at all to follow people through various public spaces, the my understanding actually is the literature on the number of crimes that it is able to solve that that, that pervasive presence has been able to solve is actually really quite limited um, but from the purposes of the public debate it really doesn't matter um, because it helped them uh, catch that bastard who raped and murdered Jill Ma and as far as most people are concerned that's the end of the argument and so I, I actually struggle to come down on the side of saying these things are bad news as well for precisely that reason. That's, that's how we're caught. These things are really useful. This kid is all really useful. That's why it's everywhere. And that's, um, that's the bargain that we've been drawn into. There's a so do you think it's a bargain that we have, not knowing the consequences of what we do when we do it? So did you notice how I didn't answer your question then? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just wish these conversations were happening a little bit more widely. Who owns that footage and who yeah, has access to it? How yeah. long is it going to be archived yeah. for? How well networked is it? And uh, to which third parties can it be passed on to? What's that? And yeah. yeah. Never. Probably never. Yeah. Is there any Australian guidelines on currently on the CCTV um, footage and any um, retention rates on that? currently in Parliament? You've asked me a question that I should honestly know the answer to and I don't. I think it's probably largely regulated by states and territories, by police forces and railway stations and people who install the kit. Mm. And the Australian privacy principles are your kind of overarching framework for how that material can be used and abused. But in terms of legislation governing you know, destruction of records and that kind of stuff, yeah. I honestly don't know. I suspect it's highly piecemeal or else maybe it doesn't exist at all. I, I guess on the topic of the records there, um, with regards to public records, there's often among public servants a confusion, and, and obviously government in Australia you know, isn't a small voting block, but um, the, the people who work these jobs have this perception that anything related to their work, be it um, recordings of audio, recordings of video, recordings of text, I anything, um, all has to be kept for five years at a minimum. Mm. It, it's quite a common misconception that they all have, which, which can tend to lead to further confusion in that area. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a horrible misconception, mm. but it certainly wouldn't help those, you know, f the video recordings and the surveillance, particularly when you mention things like police, um, railway stations and various state government departments associated with them. Yeah. Yeah, and as I say, they do have security utility. Like, I find the whole creeping police state thing utterly horrifying but um, if you're going to protect a railway station from people who might bring high explosives into it one day it's part of the toolkit that's the that is the bind that we're in yeah the other argument there is this for security guard who's going to come and help somebody out they it's much better that they know what's going a little bit more of what's going on there to assist mm. them when they actually arrive mm. I think what tends to happen is um, that the examples of genuine utility, like in Melbourne, like in the railway station example, like airport security, uh, tend to get used and highlighted and put up on pedestals as justification for a whole pile of other behaviours that are actually of no security utility at all and that are serving a completely different agenda. 
which again is a bind. It's also a very difficult political conversation to have, but it's there. Anyway, not to bring us down, everybody's looking like, oh God, yeah. we're fucked. Okay, so we're not. We still have our agency and nobody is going to put you in a van when you walk outside, which means grab this stuff with both hands. We still have agency in this. We're still participating mostly in free and fair elections. We still got a lot we can do about it. There could be a possibility that um, an organisation like ourselves, as AWIA, um, I think one of the one of the main problems for mainstream people to understand is 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 it's not a dumbed down version of it. The MBN was a hard thing to understand mm. until someone, an individual, came up with how fast is the yeah, MBN. Yeah, true. How easy was that to understand? You know, yeah. every day. Um, people download emails or upload photos to Flickr through, you know, some basic infographics. It was really easy to understand, and man, that was one of the fastest um, uh, spreading, yeah, true, um, you know, non-paid campaigns I've ever seen. Deeply upset, Twitter. Malcolm Turnbull. Very, it very did. upset. It yeah. did, uh, and you know, th there was a few things wrong with it. There was a lot of things right with it, but the thing was that it spread, and a lot of people quickly <coughs> through through a small snapshot, understood what the issues were, you know, between both sides of it. Yeah. Um, there's n there is no both sides of it in, in this particular case, but I think there's a there's an argument there for some smart people, some smart uh, visual thinkers to come up with some ways to explain mm. what it is that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, because it is a, a difficult thing to easily explain with a 30 second elevator ride what we're talking about exactly. and really that's what we're trying to do so one thing that four corners is up to but don't go out and tell the rest of the world this is probably still under embargo they um they're working on a piece on big data and on snooping not just gov government kind but the corporate time kind as well they've picked an ordinary family out in Parramatta or somewhere in western sydney and they've they've basically taken these folk they've put their hands up and they've completely stolen their lives so they've gone and downloaded and accessed absolutely everything they can a huge amount of data that this regular Australian family's generated. They're following them down the street with this little drone that they leased off somebody. And they're using them as a case study of A, how much data do you generate? Do you realize exactly how many footprints you're leaving all over the place? And B, how open are you to abuse? What could happen? What could actually happen if somebody steals your life? Whether it's government, corporate, criminal, whoever. That I think is their way of really bringing it home. So I strongly support the idea of how do we gear it to people where you can just look at it and it's going to whack you right between the eyes and probably you pass it on. That's a few people have had a go, but I'm very, very open to proposals, as you can probably tell. Well that, I mean that sounds like the right approach to me because if you've got, I mean, picking up on what you said, I don't think in infographics will, will necessarily do it, but... Um, individual case studies mm. um, will be powerful. Mm. So if you can... S ...what the issues were between both sides. One, is good, one, one page is crap. Yeah. I think it took me less than a minute to get from the top to the bottom and understand each of the particular issues that mm. were that were associated with case studies are great if people are willing to sit there for 30 minutes and read through what it is right. now, m maybe mm. it's a matter of um, you know a case study is great if you can get it to him for a minute and a half YouTube video so who knows an artist or a videographer or who is because I'm presuming we're not having this conversation in the abstract well, I don't know if there are most of the people in the room are coders but there are right. There are lots of people who have the, that ability, yep. and and I don't think a thirty-minute thing is going to going to work. Thirty seconds. It's it's got to be really. I agree. It's yep. got to be really quick, but it's got to be. Well, seconds. here's the scenario. Here's, yeah. you know, here is the information that is being accessed, and here are the consequences of it. Mm. It's the stuff in the abstract doesn't doesn't work. No. But someone has someone is doing this with my data mm. will be scary. Well, I will personally buy beer and pizza for the creative workshop where we sit down and put our heads together then, since you've shouted me. Uh, the problem with 
getting images out there to the voting public, um, explaining here's what we capture, here's what we get out of it. Um, as a federal member, um, people who actually get to make decisions on this, they've already got a pretty good visual image. They know what they're monitoring so far and they know what they're getting out of it and for a lot of them it's on a personal level. As a federal member you're going to definitely be subject to all sorts of crazy people um, sending all sorts of wonderful mail to you and whatnot. And so I suspect um, probably most of the people uh, who get to vote on this will have actually you know, received benefits from the current surveillance and, mm. you know, they'll have threats made against them um, that aren't, you know, really understood. The police can't thoroughly, you know, look into enough with the current surveillance. So for them, you know, <laughs> it's all well and good educating the voting public, but the people who actually get to make the decisions at the end of the day are getting a good deal out of this. But we're really fortunate to be living in a democracy where the peop people who make the decisions, if enough of us disagree, we can replace them. I know it's, I made it sound really easy when I said it really quickly like that, but <laughs> um, we don't live in Burma. We don't live in China. We can vote. That, I guess that's what dismays me the most about the current setup is, is a large number of people just kind of kicking along as though there's absolutely stuff all they can do. About the fact that the world's burning, um, there's an extinction crisis in play, we've reached peak oil and we're cooking the planet mm -hmm. and they're just kind of kicking along going, well, I hope, I hope somebody does something about that. We have all the agency that we need. You know, we're living in an extremely privileged time and place, amazing communications and organising tools. So I think there's plenty of opportunity to get out there and kick up a bit of a ruckus. It'd be a shame if we didn't. Do you think that uh, chance is decreasing? statistically over time chance of what to you know privacy change and reform uh it's it is decreasing radically and increasing very quickly b both at the same time like it's too hard to call are we headed for a global surveillance totalitarian dystopia uh probably or are we heading for something completely different where people take the tools of uh of mass communication and organising, and the fact that we have a global civil society that barely existed in decades past, that you can know what is happening with a revolution in North Africa as it's occurring. You can support people, you can fundraise. The guy who invented the, the, uh, the Tor protocol has been working in the Middle East and North Africa and various parts of Asia, helping activist communities protect their communications. Uh, I'm tremendously optimistic. If I thought we were out of time, I'd probably be at home really bent playing computer games, but I don't. I think we have every opportunity to seize, um, to seize the future. And we have, we have tens of millions of allies of people who feel the same way. Well, that's a, a good note to finish on, probably. Scott. Thank you very <laughs> much indeed. You're welcome. And really what I, what I heard in what you said was um, a challenge to the web community to uh, distill and to get together and do something about it. Well, um, you know, we, we can be the medium you. for that yeah. uh, and then it's up to them. I'd, I'd love to be a part of it. And remember the old, the old kind of socialist thing of, of the means of production, the seizing control of the means of production, the age that we're in and the business that you guys are in, the means of production is here. You know, we actually control that. We create the platforms. You write the stuff, what people see the tools, that's a really powerful place to be sitting, uh, given the challenges that, that we're right in the thick of. Completely agree. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us.